Hello, CIT 100 students. We are here on location in a tree to talk about file systems. Why am I in a tree to talk about file systems? Well, to answer that question, I wanted to let you know that historically, engineers of all kinds have looked to nature as a way to design human-made systems that are efficient and clever. For example, roboticists have looked at bees and birds in the way that swarm behavior is able to be coordinated without a single leader. Now, operating system engineers did not look at beetles or birds. They looked at trees. They looked at trees because it is an incredibly efficient way to organize lots of little organisms, like leaves, in a uh, very rigid way and a structured way. So, for example, let's look at this tree that I'm in. It starts with a single trunk and it branches. It branches once, it branches again up here. So we start with a single root and we can create quite a complicated structure of branches all based on a single starting point. This is particularly handy because that single starting point serves as an anchor for the entire tree. Massive trees like this have to withstand hundreds if not thousands of pounds of pressure from wind and changing temperatures, perhaps animals, and by having a core structure at the bottom, we can ground the entire tree in a stable place. Furthermore, as it branches, it's able to cover an incredible amount of area on which to grow leaves and accomplish the act of photosynthesis by soaking up the sun's energy. So from a natural perspective trees are pretty amazing and uh, operating system engineers have been able to build on that by structuring the way files are organized in a computer after the way the trees organize their leaves. So for example because it is February and there are no leaves uh, we have to make our own leaves and in this case that's handy because we are going to make metaphorical leaves that represent files and we'll jump back into the studio and discuss the digital version of our file system trees leaves uh, in just a moment. But for example if I think about the branching that occurs on this tree and I have a file here called system.dll where would system.dll be located? Let's, let's go ahead and, and store system.dll in this file tree. Okay, here's a branch. I know it's not, a, oops, sorry. Uh, I know it's not ideal, but uh, we gotta improvise. Okay, so system.dll lives in this particular branch. All right, we've got another file. Uh, notice this is called coolp.png. This is supposed to represent an image file. We can tell it's an image file because of its extension, the letters following the period, the last period in the file name. So while we have a system file that is uh, rooted in a branch over on my right, your left, we can have an image file that's located over here on a branch to my left, your right. Now, bear with me for just a second. So our image files are on this branch, our system files are on this branch. This is awfully handy because if this branch breaks, if it falls off, if someone comes around and says, what a nice branch, I'm going to chop it off, that branch can be chopped off without interrupting this branch at all. I don't even have to move it. I don't have to think about it. Now, the alternative would be organizing files in a list. So if system d.dll were in the list along with coolp.png and I needed to remove coolp.png, I potentially would have to reorganize system.dll. If nothing else, if they were organized by file number, I'd have to renumber all of the files in this list to accomplish a single change in a file. So already we can see that trees are efficient ways to store files because they allow for isolation. Isolation is handy in case corruption occurs, in case we need to copy entire chunks of data without interrupting or even accessing other chunks of data in our file system tree. Another reason that trees are handy is because they allow us to control access to an entire 
set of files. In fact, it could be a very large and expansive set of branches. And if I can control access up this one branch, if I have a, uh, say, like a checkpoint for any user or process that wants to get at system files, instead of having to attach file safety mechanisms and ensure that they work for every single file, I can ensure that the file system is secure as of this main branch, and that accomplishes security in a robust way. Your task this week is to build your own file system tree that starts with a single trunk, and that trunk should be the listing, or that trunk should be named after the topic of the information that you want to organize in your tree. And then by creating subdirectories or subfolders within that root tree, you're simulating the idea of branching. So in other words, I might have a branch for orange files that are system files and green files that are picture files. I can uh, manipulate the entire picture file chunk of the trees by simply finding the location of this one branch here and that gives me access to an entire array or set of well-organized uh, files in, uh, let's say, picture files. So with that, we will wrap up our on-location shot here and I'll meet you back in the studio for us to dig into our digital file trees. All right, wish me luck coming down. It's fall, the leaves are falling, yay! Okay. Luckily, there's a nice, um, there's a nice, um, ah, yes, this nice vine here. I can kind of shimmy down. Welcome back to our fourth and final segment of week number two of CIT 100. We're studying operating systems. We've looked at how operating systems are structured, how they work to manage CPU and memory resources. Uh, the last segment we explored the file concept and files having a type and a name that correspond with the way that the information in that file is structured. So certain applications can uh, read those files in a useful way. Our final segment is the chance for you to get creative, which is, as we saw from our on location video just a second ago, the organization of files on a computer is not a list, as one might think. In fact, the way that those files are structured is in a tree, which means there are branches and sub-branches of files and this allows for moving and transferring and copying and adjusting files in a systematic way. So the first task as described in our modules uh, exercise number three is to create a, uh, a, uh, a written tree plan of a topic that you enjoy. So on number three, I showed you an example of someone that interested in movies. And this person made a file tree of movie-related documents. I'm going to give you an example of something that I like and I miss, which is outdoor activities. We're going to think of outdoors activities as my root of the file tree. Now, in your actual computer, the root of your file tree is the actual hard disk drive. So that's where on Windows we get this idea of C colon, which means the root of our tree is C colon. And if we want to find a file there, we create a path, which means we start with the directory uh, sorry, the drive that that file exists on, and then the backslash. And so often our personal files are in a directory called users, and then the username. So my username is Eric D, and then I might have a documents directory inside users. And then when we are down at the file level, the file name 
exists right after the backslash. So if we pull up my screen here and I actually navigate into my documents, I'll pull up the file explorer. And so if I click over here, this is documents. And I can see that in my documents I have a directory called snips. And inside snips I've got a bunch of image files that I captured on the screen. So inside documents then we can see is a directory called, or sorry, folder called snips. And then finally I have the file itself. So I have a image file called file properties dot png. So file properties dot png which is my extension. The fact that I have a png at the end tells the computer that this is an image file because a png is the common extension for an image shared online. So this whole thing together is called our file path because if we want to store this file or access this file on the hard drive, the way the operating system does that is by traversing the tree, starting with the root of the tree, then finding the user directory and kind of snaking its way down. So we are going to design a file tree that doesn't live down on the C drive, but rather sits right in documents. So we could imagine that I'm, or not imagine, we are actually going to create a new directory inside documents that represents the root of our tree. So in my case, I'm going to create a directory called Outdoor Activities. Now, it is convention in the computer world that directory names and file names do not have spaces. They do not have weird characters. They don't have apostrophes or question marks or percent signs and that allows the computer to more easily organize those files and more important and more importantly you can find those files and uh, navigate on the command line if you need to without any problems. So you can include spaces in your directories and file names. Now operating systems are completely compatible with that. Older operating systems were not. And uh, in the tradition of being close to how the computer actually views files, let's not use actual uh, spaces. So let's go and start our file trees together. So here I am. I can see at this browser at the top of our uh, file explorer window I have that I'm in this PC and then documents. I can make a directory by right clicking in this open space and that will pull up a context menu so I can say uh, right click new and then up to folder and I'm going to call this Outdoor Activities. So I typed that and now I can double click to navigate into that directory. Now you'll notice there's nothing in there. I haven't put any files in that directory. I want us to build a tree that includes more than just one directory. I'm not asking you to just assemble a list of files about outdoor activities. I'm suggesting I want you to make a hierarchy or a structure of files related to a topic that's of interest to you. So in my case, I might choose to break outdoor activities down into location that I do those activities. It could be by the type of activity, so climbing or skiing or bike riding or running or walking. In my case, I'm going to choose to make subdirectories. The first one I'm going to make is uh, Utah. So Utah involves a certain set of activities. So I can go canyoneering in Utah, which is unique to canyon country. I can go canyoneering. I can also go rock climbing. These all represent directories. Once we are satisfied with the categories that I've developed or that you've developed, once we get to our lowest 
directories. This is when we can start including files. So maybe I go online or I go into my own archives and I find myself a picture of me canyoneering. So maybe it's called um, Rock Canyon dot jpg, jpeg, which is a common file extension. You're going to store this file in the folder called canyoneering. All right, so these are all folders. And this is our root folder. So let's actually make this in the digital world on our computer. So you can see if I come up here and I click the location bar, Windows has shielded me from seeing the actual path. But if I click to the right, I can now see the full path to this directory. So I'm going to do a magnifier and zoom in so I can see that my tree, the root of my tree, my outdoors activities tree, is actually mounted on the larger file system tree of users, then my username, and then my documents. So in other words, we are attaching a mini tree to a much larger tree in the operating system. So I can see that there. So I'm going to right click. I don't have anything in this directory. Go to folder. I can also use control shift N. So I need a directory called Utah. And for the sake of exploring, I might also say uh, I like to do outdoor stuff in Washington State. So I want you to see that I don't need to put just one directory. So I can come here. Again, I'm going to do Control-Shift-N for directory. And I can say Washington. Now you can decide how much you want to fill out. Maybe a lot of your outdoor activities are in Utah, so you might have a bunch more directories, but you only have one branch coming out for Washington. Trees don't have to be symmetrical. At least these kinds of trees don't. So let's go into Utah. I follow my path, so I'm going to make another directory called Canyoneering, because I like Canyoneering. And now I can navigate into Canyoneering. And what am I going to put here? Well, I would need to find a file. So you're welcome to use the World Wide Web, or maybe you have files saved on your phone. So if I come and open a Windows or an Internet browser, I have Chromium open, and I can go to a tab, and I can go to a search engine like DuckDuckGo, which does not track you, and I can say Canyoneering in Utah. And I can click Images. Look, it looks just like Google, except it's not Google. See, Canyoneering looks exciting. So these folks are Canyoneering in Bryce Canyon. I have Canyoneered in Bryce Canyon. So I can right-click it, and I can say, uh, uh, copy image address, Wait, download image. So I can say download image. And now where am I going to save it? I need to navigate my file tree all the way down to Canyoneering. I don't want to just save it in this random spot, downloads. The purpose is we are building a structured way of organizing files, not just a big list, because this is how any substantial set of files, whether it be for a business or a project, can be organized sensibly into categories and not just a big list. So I need to remember where my tree lives. The root of my tree is in documents. Oh look, outdoor activities. So now I'm traversing the tree. I'm here and then I double click into Utah. So I've just moved down to this branch. I moved into canyoneering. And now that I'm in canyoneering, you can see the file path is up here. Now I can say, uh, I can name my file something sensible. Don't just let it be named something arbitrary. So this was in Bryce Canyon. Bryce Canyon uh, Canyoneering. Dot JPG. Now don't forget, that file extension should stay on there. And it should correspond with the type of file it is. So this is an image file stored in the JPEG format. It needs an extension JPG. Now that I saved that piece of media, I can verify that it made it into the proper directory by going back to Windows Explorer. I can use my newfound skills at File Detectiveness and hit uh, Properties and see, all right, 
This is where it lives. It is indeed a JPEG photo. I can see that Windows will automatically open it in a program called Photos, and it's only 36 kilobytes big. So 36,000 bytes, multiply that by 8 to get bits, and uh, we can see exactly how much space it takes up. So that's cool. I want you to build out a interesting file tree. Maybe aim for approximately 10 folders and you know maybe 15 different files images are fine logos are fine you can also include links to web addresses and to do that we right click in our space instead of making a directory we can say new shortcut and it'll open a dialog box what item would you like to create a shortcut for so the, lo uh, the type type the location of the item. So this could be a web address. So maybe I want to do a search for uh, canyoneering in Utah and I see a guide here, canyoneering USA is a common site. And so I can uh, navigate here if I want to let someone give someone a link. I can click the link bar. I can do control C for copy. Come back to my shortcut creation wizard paste in the uh, web address or the URL, hit, uh, then I can hit next, and then type the name of the shortcut. This will be the name of the file. So I can say Canyoneering USA page. And hit finish. So now what we found, if we come back to our file explorer, is look, we now have two files down here. Not only do I have um, Bryce Canyon Canyoneering.jpg, but I have, so I have a .jpeg here. I also have, um, my handwriting is glorious, isn't it? I also have um, a link, so Canyoneering USA. Now, this does not store the web page itself. It's only storing enough information to get the internet browser back to that page. So if we click, uh, right click and go to properties, we'd expect it to be a really small file because it's not storing much information. And we can come back to general. Ooh, look, it's only 125 bytes. It's very small. It's not storing information other than that web link. And so once you have your file tree all nicely packaged or all nicely created, I want you to jump back to the root of the tree and we are going to do something called compress or zip all of these files. This is a tool inside the operating system and I can tell it by right clicking this root of the tree and telling it to compress all of these files and directories, what it's going to do is it's going to navigate the entire tree and it's going to glue them together and it will allow us to name this whole chunk of directories and files as one file with a .zip extension. .zip means it is compressed and I can use a program on the other end, someone else that downloads your file tree, which we'll do next, uh, next week, and we can uncompress it and actually view and traverse the tree, add to it, and so forth. Now, when we compress it, it will ask for a name, so I uh, will give it a name that corresponds with what the tree is about and then who I am. So let's do that together. So I can right-click, this is my root, and I can say send to compressed or zip folder. Now notice when I do that, the uh, operating system allows me to write a new name. So I don't want to just call it outdoor activities. I want to call it file tree underscore outdoor activities, my first name, and then my ID number dot zip. That will allow some us to upload all of this data together in one chunk and someone can download it together in one chunk and then extract it and that will reconstruct the file tree as we made it on our own computers. That's very handy. So enjoy making your own file tree. I think that we'll have a good time looking through the kind of creative things that you've done. There's also a link in the video or in the uh, weekly guide for a directory that has uh, about 30 other students' file trees.